So today we're going to look at collision theory, which tries to explain kinetics in terms of what is happening on the molecular level. In the previous two classes, we've looked at rate laws and integrative rate laws, which are experimentally determined. That means we can do those things in the lab. We can take the measurements in the lab. We're not looking at individual atoms or molecules or ions. Um, so when we look at individual atoms or molecules or ions, we use something called collision theory, which says that these individual atoms, molecules, or ions must collide in order to react. But not only do they have to collide, but they have to have an effective collision. An effective collision is one that actually causes the reactants to turn into products. So there are a couple of aspects to an effective collision we need to think about. One is called activation energy. If the molecules collide, but they don't have enough energy to cause anything to happen, then they do not have sufficient energy to react. So the amount of energy they have to collide with in order for them to react with each other is referred to as the activation energy. We also have to look at orientation. Because the molecules have to collide, they also have to collide in the right orientation in order for the parts of the molecule that are actually reacting to react. And so that has to do with the structure of the reactants themselves. And we can also take a look at, on the atomic level, on the molecular level, what's happening with concentration and how changes in concentration affect what's happening on a molecular level. So let's look at effective collisions. Here's a reaction, carbon monoxide plus nitrogen dioxide becoming carbon dioxide plus nitrogen monoxide. So pretty much this carbon over here is picking up an oxygen from this nitrogen over here. So in, a, in order for that to happen, two things must affer, occur. First, the carbon must hit an oxygen. So the carbon is hitting an oxygen. So a carbon to oxygen bond can form. The other thing that has to happen in order for this part to occur is that I ha this carbon must hit this oxygen with enough energy to break the bond here and then form a bond between carbon and oxygen. So for this effective collision to take place, I need this orientation and enough energy. This orientation will always cause an ineffective collision, no matter how much energy the molecules have, or how much energy they collide with, because that carbon is colliding with the nitrogen. And the carbon is not reacting with the nitrogen, it's reacting with an oxygen. So this would not be an effective collision, and this would be an effective collision. Now we can look at concentration effects on a molecular level. Here I have a reactant molecule in red and a bunch of blue reactant molecules. So this molecule is bouncing around and eventually it will collide with the blue molecule and form a product. If I increase the concentration of red molecules, then I get more collision. So it's more likely that the red molecules will collide with the blue molecules in such a way as to form a product. Likewise, if I leave the concentration of red molecules the same, but increase the concentration of blue molecules, I again am more likely to have a collision, and that makes it more likely that the, I will have an effective collision, so I will form products. So this is how we explain concentration effects on a molecular level. Now we can look at this graphically by looking at a reaction profile or an activation energy diagram. That's another name for this. So on the left we have our reactants, and our reactants have a certain amount of energy associated with them. Over here we have our products. Our products have a different amount of energy associated with them. So that difference in energy between reactants and products is my delta H. In this graph, the products have less energy than the reactants, which means when I went from reactants to products, energy was given off, thus the negative sign. Energy went from the system, which are these molecules, to the surroundings, the air, the thermometer, etc. But not only do I have that part of the graph to consider, but I need to consider this part, the hill part. 
because we know in collision theory that we need the molecules to collide with enough energy, the hill represents that amount of energy. In this reaction profile, these molecules must hit with an energy equal to 134 kilojoules in order to react. So if I add 134 kilojoules of energy to the reactants, they can go over the hill, and not only do they give me my 134 kilojoules back, but they give me an additional 226 kilojoules. Up here you can see we have something called the transition state, or activated complex. This is simply the point at which reactants are turning into products. I do not have reactants anymore. I do not have products yet. This is not, this is transition. This is transitory. That means it does not last. You can't isolate this. It's just this uh, um, in-between state between reactants and products. Now, the other thing you'll notice is this over here. We're going to look at this a lot when we look at equilibrium, but if we want to look at the reverse reaction, we want to take our products and turn them back into reactants. You can see that we have to add all this energy back in. We have to add in the negative 226 kilojoules that was given off. We have to add in the 134 to get over the top of the hill. That 134 kilojoules we get back, but we have to add that net of 226 kilojoules into the reactants into these products to get them to turn back into reactants. So we can see that the activation energy for the re reverse reaction takes us from all the way down here and over the hill. So even though this hill itself doesn't change, the graph doesn't change, when we go from the forward reaction to the reverse reaction, we have a different activation energy. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at the effects of temperature on reaction rate. We know that a rate law is good at a given temperature because as the temperature changes, so does the rate law. So here we have a graph, a distribution of the amount of kinetic, number of molecules with a given amount of kinetic energy at two different temperatures. So this is fraction of molecules with a given kinetic energy on the y, and then this is the actual amount of kinetic energy on the x. This is referred to as a Boltzmann distribution. So at T1, you can see that even though individual molecules have varying kinetic energies, most of them have a kinetic energy that's somewhere in here. And in fact, in chemistry, we've defined temperature as a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules. in a sample. That's temperature. So at T1, you can see there are a lot of molecules down in this area over here. And as we get to higher energies, there are fewer and fewer molecules with that amount of kinetic energy. Down here, we have a line that represents the activation energy for a particular reaction. So in at temperature 1, only these molecules here have enough energy to react. Of course, they would also have to collide with the right orientation, but if they did, they would have sufficient energy to react. So now, if I raise the temperature, so now I'm at a higher temperature, you can see what happens. This graph flattens out, but really what happens is the number of molecules with higher kinetic energy increases. So now I have more molecules with higher kinetic energy. So when I hit this point where I have the kinetic energy to react, or the activation energy, you can see that you pick up additional molecules 
with enough energy to react. So that's why typically when temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction. Now, we can quantify this and quantify the temperature effects on the rate law um, using something called the Arrhenius equation. 